Queen Mary 2 is a monstrous ship, the last ocean liner constructed and, until 2006, the largest passenger ship ever built. 345 meters, or 1,132 feet long, and weighing in at a whopping 80,000 tons displacement. Now, 80,000 tons is the equivalent of 3,200 fully loaded 18 wheel semi trailers, or 6,324 London buses. Now, that's a heck of a lot of weight. And the question is naturally asked how on earth can it float? Well, the answer is tied to a mixture of simple physics, complex mathematics, and an ancient Greek inventor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we'll answer the question that all of us have probably thought about at one point or another, how do ships float? Water. It covers about 71% of our Earth's surface, with vast oceans spanning thousands and thousands of miles. Our ancient ancestors first took to the sea in fairly primitive wooden boats, but since then, you could say, things have changed somewhat. In a relatively short space of time, ships have exploded in size. In fact, the largest passenger ship in the world right now is the Icon of the Seas, at 248,000 gross tons at about 100,000 tons displacement. Now hang on, I hear you ask, what's the difference? Well, when we talk about the size of a ship, we actually use two different measures to gauge how big it is. The first is gross tonnage. Now this is a measure of a ship's internal volume, essentially a very simple way of gauging how much of a ship's bulk is actually useful space. Gross tonnage measures the volume of a space inside a ship's hull and superstructure, which can be used for passengers, crew, and cargo. But the ship's actual weight, the displacement, is something different entirely. It's the weight of all the components and all the steel used to actually form the ship in the first place. Now to understand how displacement works, we have to take a little trip back to ancient Greece. The ability of ships to float is primarily explained by the principle of buoyancy which the ancient Greek inventor Archimedes famously outlined more than 2,000 years ago. Buoyancy refers to the upward force exerted by a fluid, like water, that opposes the weight of an object that is immersed in it. The Archimedes principle is the cornerstone for understanding how ships, regardless of their size and their weight, actually manage to stay afloat. Now, Archimedes' principle states that the buoyant force of an object submerged in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Now, this sounds complex, but it basically just means that for a ship to float, it must displace water equal in weight to its own mass. Now, this is why a ship's weight is really referred to as its displacement, that is, how many tons the hull displaces overall in water. Now, water displacement actually plays a crucial role in a ship's buoyancy, that is, the reason a big ship floats in the first place. A ship's hull, although it's made up of heavy steel, is actually, for its size, comparatively lightweight and flexible. The design of a ship's hull is particularly important, because it needs to displace enough water to balance the ship's weight. The shape of the hull is often broad and deep, allowing a large volume of water to be displaced around it. As a ship is loaded, it sits lower in the water, displacing more and more water until the buoyant forces balances the ship's weight back, allowing it to float. To put it simply, imagine you have a toy boat and you put it in a bathtub full of water. When you do that, some of the water moves out of the way to make room for the boat. Displacement. Now Archimedes' principle is the rule that says the boat can float because it pushes away water that weighs the same as the boat does. Now if you push down on the boat and it goes deeper, it moves more water out of the way, and then that water then pushes back up on the boat to help it float. So as long as the boat doesn't let water inside of itself, it will stay floating. Now the concept of water displacement is also essential in understanding how ships carry heavy loads. A ship's load, that is how much additional weight that the ship is carrying, like cargo, 
effects its buoyancy by increasing the overall weight, requiring it to displace more water in order to stay afloat. Naval architects design ships' hulls to maximize water displacement without compromising the ship's stability or safety. In fact, the way dock workers actually measure how much cargo a ship has taken on board is by simply looking at how deeply the ship is sitting in the water compared to usual. But why doesn't a ship just sink down right away? Well, the concept of density is key to this. Density is defined as mass per unit volume. The density of an object determines whether it will float or sink in a fluid. Now, an object will float if it is less dense than the fluid it is in. So ships, although they're made of materials that by themselves are denser than water, float because the overall density of the entire ship, including all that air inside the hull, is less than that of the water it is sitting in. By that token, if you created an ocean of liquid of a much lower density than water, like vegetable oil, alcohol, or gasoline, a ship would sink right away because the delicate balance would be thrown off. Interestingly, this actually affects the way that different ships behave in different oceans and water conditions. Now we know that water density impacts the way a ship actually floats, then the question might come up, what about the condition of the water? Well, fresh water, hot water, cold water, salt water, it all has different impacts on the water and the way a ship floats. That's why ships have markings on their hulls to show how deep they actually should be sitting in the water depending on different conditions. For example, ships have side markings called the plimsoll line that show where a ship should be sitting in cold winter North Atlantic waters, which are more dense, or warm tropical fresh water, which is much less dense. Not all water is the same. Now the design of a ship incorporates voids and compartments within its hull, which are filled with air of course, reducing the overall density of the ship. Now this design ensures that despite being made up of steel or other dense materials, the ship as a whole is less dense than the water it displaces, allowing it to float. I mentioned earlier that Icon of the Seas is the equivalent weight of over 6,000 London buses. Well, a London bus is heavy and compact, or rather, extremely dense. If you put it in water, it'd sink down right away. But by contrast, a huge ship is actually very hollow inside, full of voids, and lightly built for a vehicle of that size, it's much less dense by comparison, so it will simply float. Now, the stability of a floating ship is a critical aspect of its design, closely related to buoyancy. Stability involves not just staying afloat, that's the easy part, but doing so in a manner that's safe and efficient, even in rough waters. Now, this is achieved through the distribution of weight within the ship, and especially the design of the hull. The centre of gravity and the centre of buoyancy are two critical points in understanding a ship's stability and the way it will behave in the ocean. The centre of gravity is the point where the ship's mass is concentrated, while the centre of buoyancy is where the force of buoyancy, the flotation, actually acts. Now, it's typically at the centre of the displaced volume of water. Now, naval architects and engineers always fiddle with the proportion of their ship's hulls to actually attain the exact centres of gravity and buoyancy they need to create a stable ship. In fact, different ships actually roll in different ways. For passenger ships, it's actually better for naval engineers to adjust the ship's hull so that the ship rolls slowly and more comfortably instead of snapping back and forth. By adjusting the centre of gravity and the centre of buoyancy, then naval engineers can actually alter the way the ship will behave at sea. Now the physics of water displacement and buoyancy don't just explain how ships float, they also guide the design principles and operation of vessels of all different sizes. From small boats, like toy boats, to gigantic cruise ships, the principles outlined by Archimedes 2000 years ago actually all act in the same way. Back then, in Archimedes' day, ships weighed only 45 tons or so, but today cruise ships can displace as much as 100,000 tons of water or more. In fact, the largest ship in history, the Seawise Giant, displaced 670,000 tons of water. Now, so long as the world's oceans remain made up of salt water, then ships will continue to float. Unless they change overnight to a less dense liquid, like vegetable oil. Then, and only then, 
we might be in some trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.